Well, a pint of science. I arrived a little bit late, trying to get the latest issue of our magazine out to the printer. You can all hear me at the back there, can you? Great. Uh, so, I won't be able to have any of my dark matter or dark energy. Uh, but I've got a pair of dark binoculars as well. And that's the only prop you really need for astronomy. 20 quid a little these days. That's why we don't run an astronomy shop anymore. <laughs> it was always the sideline for us anyway, trying to get people interested in astronomy. And this is our magazine. Uh, astronomy Island magazine published by Astronomy Island. We like to keep it simple. And there's a free copy for everyone in the audience. <laughs> so, Tanya and Rachel back up there. Why don't you pass them out, Tanya? Uh, pass a few up here and make sure you go away with a, with a copy of the magazine. So what we try to do is get people interested in astronomy. And we've been fairly successful. Uh, 25,000 people on our mailing list in this country alone. Uh, it's about 4,000 magazines go out every month, which is not bad for a pure science uh, magazine. Um, I was told, just to get a quick survey, that I've got about 20, 30 minutes to cover the universe, <laughs> including Listu and Varna in space. Uh, so that's going to be a short order. What's the audience like? Are you all, how uh, many of you have science degrees? Quick show of hands. Uh, I thought you might. <laughs> so you've got to catch me out on all the equations. And how many of you don't have any science training at all? Okay, well, this talks for you. So everybody else can go see. Uh, what's my point? Oh, it's just there on the other part. Actually, oh, no. there we go. And I can control my own slides here, yeah? So here we are. Now, some of you probably can't see this screen, can you? Uh, that's a pity, because it's a visual talk. <laughs> but I'll tell a few stories as we're going along. And come in. Uh, we have, we have uh, lots cozy. of talks ourselves, as Neve said. I'm glad here she's come to a few of them. I'm a big fan of hers, uh, just to Nothing. reciprocate. Our next talks about black holes and star formation in the early universe uh, by, by Dr. Yorick Bink from Arma Observatory. Black holes are always a hot topic. And there's a thing about the dark ages of the universe uh, just when matter formed, but the first stars were about to form, uh, we had these giant stars that probably formed the first black holes at the cores of galaxies. And one thing I'm trying to do in this talk is to keep it very Irish. And we now know that there are black holes in the centres probably of all galaxies, uh, but we also know that they slow down the rate at which galaxies form, and that gives stars like the Sun a chance to create planets, and for those planets to last long enough for life to evolve on them. So the black hole at the centre of our galaxy, that's about six, it's about five million times bigger than the sun, it effectively gave us life. We wouldn't have been around this long had it not been for that black hole. And it was an Irishman that discovered this relationship, uh, John Magorian. It's called the Magorian relationship after him. And it's nice to see that you know, the Irish are at the cutting edge of astrophysics research. <laughs> And I'm going to start out with the, the, just the talk by a bit of a preamble at the back that I think the Irish invented astronomy. I mean, Newgrange is the oldest astronomically aligned building anywhere in the world. It predates the pyramids, predates Stonehenge by centuries. Uh, so the Irish were watching the stars very closely. The main thing they were interested in, I know today we're interested in whether the universe is 13.8 or 13.7 billion years old, but back then they were worried about how long is the year. That was a matter of life and death for them. They're an agricultural economy, and if they didn't have enough crops for the winter, uh, then they died. As simple as that. So they, there's evidence that they knew that the year was 365 and a quarter days. And that quarter is very important because every century it adds up to 25 days, about a month. And the word month or month comes from mapping out the year with 12 full moons. They noticed this as well. It got warm and cold in Ireland every 12 months, every 12 full moons. That's where the month word month came from. Uh, there's a few extra days on top of it, we now know, and they had to adjust their calendar even worse than the leap day that we add in every four years. Uh, but they, you know, to know today that the universe is 13.8, probably rather than 13.7 billion years, is important for our science. Back then, that quarter of a year was very important to them. So they were mapping the skies very carefully. When you zoom forward 5,000 years to the uh, 19th century, you find the biggest telescope in the world was the Burr in County Offaly, the Hubble Space Telescope of its day. Astronomers came from all over the world to Ireland, despite our weather, to look through the telescope. And uh, uh, Lord Ross was, at that time, was very accommodating. And the great discoveries of the day sorry, back Mike, then... Can you, yeah. oh, sorry, is yeah, Mike, yeah. can you? Yeah, uh, the great discoveries of the day back then were that these uh, 
fuzzy objects they could see in the sky, which a lot of people thought if you built a big enough telescope, you'd ultimately resolve them into individual stars. So there were lots of star clusters. Uh, but other people thought there were, there were a different class of objects. And the big questions of, are, were some of these objects island universes? They call them island universes, we now call them galaxies. And eventually they figured out that there were other galaxies, that our own Milky Way was one galaxy with roughly a trillion stars. As we now know, there's roughly a trillion uh, galaxies in the universe, roughly a trillion trillion stars in the observable universe. And that started in Ireland, if you like. Uh, and even today, Irish researchers at the cutting edge, uh, one of them, uh, Professor Tom Ray, sat on the panel that uh, controls the Hubble Space Telescope. And, you know, an Irish man was making decisions about who in the world gets to use the Hubble Space Telescope of its day in this century rather than the 19th century. And Astronomy Ireland, there must be something in the genes relative to population. It's the biggest astronomy club in the world. It's about the same size as the one in the UK, and they've obviously got 10, 15 times the population. So that's a bit of a background to astronomy. On their evening classes happening in October. Uh, if you want to get on our mailing list, astronomy.ie slash friend. Astronomy.ie is all you need to know. It's all there. Um, you'll find out what's about the mailing list and all the other events that are going on uh, back there. Uh, just before I start on the whistle-stop tour of the universe, a few Irish things thrown in. Uh, the uh, One thing that I... We've been telling school children a lot because the first person to land on Mars is probably at school today. Is that, uh, you know, this is astronomy is science lark, it's a bit esoteric for them, but 60% of Ireland's GDP, last time I checked, is science based. We have all those farm, farm, uh, pharmaceutical companies, all the electronic manufacturers, software supplies, and all those kind of businesses, which is three times the size of the construction business at its peak. So Ireland is a science economy. Most of the jobs these kids are going to be working in is science-based, and a lot of them uh, love Iron Man and Hollywood. Um, surprised that uh, when you tell them that he, he's uh, Tony Stark is actually based on a real uh, physicist, Elon Musk, who set up PayPal, which he sold for about a billion dollars in 2003. And what do you buy if you've got a billion dollars? Well, the answer is a space company and an electric car company as well. But forget that for the moment. It's the space company where it is, and, and now he has multi-billion dollar contracts per year coming in from NASA uh, to build the craft that are servicing the Hubble Space, uh, the International Space Station. And I've seen them flying across our skies just last month. And he said that he's going to put 80,000 people on Mars during his lifetime. And the last time I checked earlier this year, I think it was 43. So when somebody with a multi-billion dollar business track record says he's going to put 80,000 people on Mars, you sort of have to believe he stands a good chance of doing it uh, with his record. Let's hope he's right, because that means there's going to be loads of jobs for all these young kids in Irish schools, <laughs> and maybe we'll end up with more astronauts uh, in the world. There are a big diaspora out there on Mars as well as around this particular planet. So a quick look at the Earth. This is my favorite uh, picture of the Earth, because it was taken 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, by the Apollo 17 astronauts on their way back from space. Still an iconic photograph. On this scale, the International Space Station only gets about the width of your finger above the surface of the Earth. It doesn't need to go any further for its research purposes. The Apollo astronauts took this from about eight times the width of the Earth away. And you can see the continents and life on the Earth. So the dark patch you can see under the clouds in Central Africa here, that's life staining the ground. It's grasslands, rainforests, it's plant life staining the ground, just as we'll see on Mars when we get there. So you can see life from space on a planet like the Earth. Covered in water, of course, unlike any other planet. Uh, and now we think there's intelligent life on this particular planet. <laughs> uh, so we love this particular picture. Uh, I'll move on. Uh, the quick tour we're going to take, I won't bore you, I think most of you know about the four rocky inner planets, uh, the four gas giants. We'll take a quick look at them all and see if there's any much Irish involvement with them. I love telling kids about the sun being a star like any other, only it's a million times closer. The temperature is 15 million degrees Celsius, and when you're talking to six-year-olds up, uh, you can't really explain what 15 million Celsius is, to them, except to explain that if they took a pinhead-sized speck out of a filament of a light bulb, that's a couple of thousand degrees Celsius, obviously it wouldn't light up the room or blind them. But a pinhead-sized speck off the surface of the sun would light up the room and would hurt their eyes, but if they could somehow pluck a pinhead-sized speck from the center of the sun at 15 million degrees Celsius, it would vaporize their school. <laughs> and if somehow you could hold that up high enough that people 100 miles away, say Dublin to Galway, as we are in the country talking about this, uh, then the people in Dublin looking over at Galway with this pinhead size spec would see it in broad daylight. So well, in fact, 
it would blind them, and if they raised their arm to shield themselves from a pinhead size speck at 15 million Celsius, 100 miles, 150 kilometers say, away, blisters would come up on their arm. That's what 15 million Celsius means. It's very easy to say these big numbers in astronomy, but it's very hard to imagine them. Uh, we love these explosions on the sun. There was one, actually, the uh, last few days, we are hoping was going to cause an aurora last night. It looks like the radiation missed us, and there wasn't an aurora last night. But we've had five alerts on our mailing list so far since St. Patrick's Day. Some nice pictures going into the next issue of the magazine from St. Patrick's Day. Uh, although I saw nothing very foggy in, in Dublin where I was. And these are the exp explosions that cause it. Uh, so watch out for the aurora. If you like aurora trips, come with uh, myself and Leo Enright. We're off to Norway for the fifth time in November this year, details are on the website. The plants going around, Mercury just had the messenger probe crash into it there a few weeks ago. Um, a tiny little rocky body looks just like the moon because it's no gravity to hold on to any air. Anyone see it earlier this month? There's no astronomers in the audience, even our own members. Traitors, how could you? <laughs> These lies. <laughs> well, on the 5th and 6th of May, Mercury is at its best. Every, uh, about a week every April, May or so, it gets visible in the evening skies. You have to know where to look for about a week. Um, right. Some great astronomers say that uh, the history is that they probably never saw it, because you have to actually go out and look for it. It's very hard to see. But the next one, Venus, is very easy to see. This is the highlight of the next month, because I don't know if you've seen over in the west, as the sun goes down, there's a brilliant star, that's Venus, for those of you that know. But there's another one to the upper left, that's Jupiter. And if you've been watching them over the last few weeks, they've been getting closer and closer. And they're off to a historic encounter, uh, a conjunction, we call it. They're almost going to merge into one, as seen with the naked eye. They'll be closer than the two cusps of a crescent moon will be. So the human eye will be able to distinguish them. And these are the two brightest star-like objects in the sky. Uh, we ran some calculations, and they won't get this close again until uh, March of 2023, eight years from now. They will technically be 50% uh, further apart then, but they'll look just as spectacular. They'll be a little bit higher up. So watch out for that. June the 30th is the date but they'll be close for several days either side. Uh, so this Venus, what looks like up close to the spacecraft, and we're, uh, if you have a telescope on June the 30th, you'll probably see a disk, and you'll see the disk of Jupiter in the same field of view at high magnification at the same time. I've never seen that happen before. We're hoping June the 30th will be clear. Uh, this Venus, of course, the dark patches are not the ground. They're just darker clouds lower down. We now know Although Venus is the same size as the Earth, very similar, it's got a runaway greenhouse effect with over 90% of the air carbon dioxide, which drives the temperature up to 450 to 500 degrees Celsius, which is actually hotter than Mercury, which is twice as close to the sun as Venus is. So this is an example of what can happen when the greenhouse effect takes hold. Um, there's no water on Venus' uh, surface, it's way too hot. In fact, the rocks are almost glowing this color. And we think the water on the Earth acts as a lubricant to let the plates on the Earth's crust slide around, a bit like an oil. But on Venus, that doesn't happen. And so the heat builds up inside, and these peaks are thought to be volcanoes. Probably not active, and maybe every few hundred million years, when the heat inside, which is caused by radioactive waste re, uh, decaying, builds up the same way the Earth is, is heated from inside. Uh, because Venus' crust is solid, it eventually builds up too much heat, blows its top, the uh, volcanoes go off, resurface the whole planet, and then it's set solid again, and probably after a few hundred million years, that, that could happen again. So although it's a very similar plan to the Earth, uh, it's completely different, and we can learn a lot from what might happen to the Earth if we're a bit too silly, and let, it happen, let Venus happen to the Earth. And that's Venus. I uh, say so you can see Venus quite well. We're on to the Earth now very quickly. The Moon is the first uh, satellite we've seen of a planet, and the the Earth rise there. Photographs is thought to have given rise to the whole ecological movement. When people realize you're on the moon, you can stick your thumb up in the sky and cover the Earth, which then had three billion people on it, seven now, in one thumb. And it made people realize how fragile space, spaceship Earth was. And I had the pleasure of meeting Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and asking them about this. And you can just imagine that experience also being a quarter of a million miles away from your fellow humans, Earthlings. And a classic picture. Uh, another one to go with the first one of, of the Apollo, uh, also taken by Apollo 17. We've seen, we've seen, well, before we finish that, we've seen the Earth and uh, the Moon already. We know about moons being where our calendar came from. Uh, another thing I tell kids is that, of course, your birthday or any, any anniversary is an astronomical event. When kids are having their birthday, what they're celebrating is they've arrived back in space at the point they were born. 
so there should actually be a plaque all around the Earth's orbit for every one of us <laughs> that was born, you know? And you could work out, actually, you want to get to do a bit of maths, get to work out how far apart the plaque should be if there's 7 billion of us and we're 150 million kilometers away from the Earth. Uh, and they're not actually going to be that close together, so there'll be plenty of room to put nice big plaques. So that's the Earth. We'll move on to Mars. I said that we saw life on, on the Earth staining the, the ground. And this is what people saw. It's not the best picture ever taken of Mars. Where this kind of picture I've seen in a telescope uh, from Ireland. And you see these, whoops, you see these dark patches. And the astronomers in the 1800s, when they built the first telescopes that were powerful to show these dark patches well, you notice that they change shape a little bit in the seasons on Mars. You can see it's got a nice cap. Mars axis is tilted over as well, similar to the Earth. It spins about once every 24 hours as well, so it has days like the Earth. It doesn't have all the water we have, but I've seen these ice caps, and I've seen these blue wispy stuff you can see at the top are clouds. I've seen the clouds on Mars through a small telescope. Uh, probably would have had better ones even in the Victorian era. And so they thought what was happening is the ice caps were melting every year in the summer. Uh, the dark patches were getting darker. They were growing. The most obvious explanation for what that was was vegetation. Most astronomers of the day in the 1800s would have thought that Mars had at least simple plant life staining the ground like we saw on the Earth. And then some of them thought they saw thin lines crisscrossing Mars' surface. We know that's really an optical illusion. They were straining too hard to see. The clue should have been that when they drew maps of it, everybody drew different sort of thin lines. And those, those uh, canali, as they were called in Italian, meaning channels, got translated literally into canals. And of course, around 1898, when H.G. Wells wrote his famous book, The War of the Worlds, he was just dramatizing one of the astro astronomical theories of the day, that there was certainly life on Mars, that's obvious. Uh, but if there was intelligent life, they just about built, I think they built the, the Suez Canal, and they were trying to build the Panama Canal, but the French had failed, and uh, later on it was built by the Americans, I think. So the big engineering projects were to build canals just a few hundred kilometers long, uh, on Mars, they were 10 times longer, and the planet was dying. So those aliens must be a lot more advanced than us. So any idea that they'd rub their hands together when they saw that lovely blue planet I showed you at the start with loads of water, and they'd go there and kick the Earth things off. It was a no-brainer. H.G. Wells wrote into a book, and in 2003, I think it was, even Tom Cruise still made his highest grossing movie <laughs> ever on the basis of that book. So it's been a popular story, and that's where all the stories of the Martians come from. We now know the dark patches do change as the seasons change on Mars, but all that's happening is the shifting sands of Mars. The winds change direction as well. It blows a bit of sand onto the dark patches, which are bare rock, and the light patches are sandy desert. So it's the shifting sands on Mars, not life at all. Uh, so a fascinating plan that gives rise to a lot of, a lot of folklore. Uh, of course, Mars is only half the width of the Earth. You can talk all night about Mars or any of the planets. It has about as much gravity and weighs three times less. Uh, the air has escaped. The core is smaller. Uh, it's probably gone solid. Therefore, the magnetic field is dried up and the radiation from the sun stripped the atmosphere away. But there was enough water on Mars to have an, uh, an ocean uh, that covered most of the surface. And uh, there's still enough water frozen below the surface, I think, that you could, if you melted it all, spread it evenly around Mars. It's, I think, 30 meters deep. It's many, many, many meters deep anyway. So there's plenty of water locked up below the surface of Mars, but no conditions are suitable to have liquid water on the surface today. But Elon Musk will no doubt figure out a way around that <laughs> before he retires. Uh, so that's Mars. Uh, it has two moons, which you now know are asteroids, these little minor plants between the orbits of Mars and, uh, and Jupiter. Uh, moving on to our uh, uh, a real asteroid, the first one was photographed up close by a spacecraft that was on its way out to Jupiter. It sent back the first picture of an a real asteroid. You thought they probably looked like this, potatoes. <laughs> and this one's called Gaspar. And when they uh, saw all these craters on on Gaspar, they said, well, we'll name them uh, after something interesting. What's Gaspar? What was it named after? It was named after a town in Crimea that was famous for having a spa, a place where people went to take the mineral waters, uh, like Bath. So they named them after spa towns around the world. Uh, Bath, I think, is that one there. <laughs> uh, they want to know the name of uh, this one here, at the very top. You probably can't see it at the back there. Well, I can tell you, that's Lisdun Barney. Hey. <laughs> that's where Lisdun Barney is. It's on an asteroid between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. There's a spa, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's still in Barna. Uh, next time we're down in County Clare, do check it out. And I wonder if they all know that there's, an ast uh, there's a crater or an asteroid named after them. So actually, the spacecraft got out to Jupiter. Uh, this is the planet we can see closing in on Venus now in the evening skies. And we're running a telescope watch next uh, Wednesday, no, uh, Wednesday week, the 27th of May. One week later, we have our evening classes during the summer. 
and it's to promote those. But you'll get to see Jupiter, and you'll see these long, thin cloud belts streaking out because the planet, although it's 11 times wider than the Earth, spins two and a half times faster, which is a bit crazy. Uh, I always tell the kids it's five times further from the sun than we are, so it's freezing cold out here. It looks nice and warm and inviting, but there's deadly radiation at cloud tops that would kill you in minutes. And not only that, but the, the hottest part on Jupiter, where the sun beats down overhead, is minus 130 degrees Celsius. So your fingers would freeze and you could snap them off as icicles. The kids love that. I <laughs> Um, you could talk all day about Jupiter, but let's have a look at its moons. Over 60 moons, but there are four big ones. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Active volcanoes on Io. Uh, you can see it in the telescope very easy. In fact, you can see it in a pair of binoculars like those ones there, if you hold them steady. Uh, Europa, we now think, has an ocean below its ice crust. It's about the size of the moon, so a good bit smaller than the Earth. But it has twice as much water in those oceans as the Earth does in its oceans, and it's warm. And the whole idea is there could be these... Uh, you know, black smokers at the bottom of, um, that we have at the bottom of the ocean, where life could have got formed. There's a lot of energy down there. And if that's true, then if the way we think life got started on the Earth is correct, then there, sh there should be something interesting, at least interesting chemistry going on in Europa. And the question is, how far did it get? And no one's thinking there's going to be dolphin cities there. But even just simple life, or even simple self-replicating molecules, it would give us a, a good step along the theory of how we think life got here. Now it turns out Ganymede, the next moon out, uh, has also got uh, an ocean below it. Callisto might even have one, the outermost moon. So when you look at these through the telescope next week, if you come along to our watch, um, they're all fascinating places. Well, by the way, on Europa, uh, some of the fractured ice on the surface looks like parts of a Connemara. So there is actually a Connemara in space as well, on the second big moon of Jupiter. And this is the hot tip where there's life in the, universe, uh, in the solar system apart from the Earth, other than Mars. I'd actually ex suspect Europa is more likely than Mars is. The Great Red Spot, huge swirling hurricane. We can see this in the telescope. We had a Jupiter watch a few weeks, months ago, and you can actually see the Red Spot quite well. It's not as red as this. The picture, the colors have been exaggerated, uh, but the wind speeds at the edge are about uh, 500 kilometers per hour, much faster than we have on the, uh, ever had on the Earth, and they've been blowing for several centuries. The question now is, will the Red Spot last? There's some idea it might vanished by about 2040. Uh, moving on out to Saturn, which is just coming into the evening sky now. It's very low down, uh, but we're, we'll have a watch for this. We have a big fundraising and barbecue event in, in August. It'll be the star attraction with the lovely rings. The view of this in a giant telescope from Ireland is absolutely breathtaking. Make sure you get a look at it at least once in your life. Uh, going around is over six, 60 moons again. My favorite one is Titan, minus 190 degrees Celsius, but with a nitrogen atmosphere, one and a half times thicker than the one you're breathing now just very cold, and liquid hydrocarbons on the surface, and possibly water trapped below the, uh, the, the surface of that. So a crazy uh, planet, which we've dropped the probe onto. The rings, of course, the moon, they got a bit too close and got shredded. Um, you look close up, it's boulders following each other around Saturn, like follow my lead. You could argue Saturn's billions of moons. Then you can't see the next two planets, Sirius and Neptune, easily. Uh, you need a pair of binoculars to see them. and uh, there'll, uh, there'll be targets at the event in, in the summer. Uh, Uranus was knocked over on its side. We think one of its moons, Miranda, was also smashed apart, probably by comets that came in from the outer solar system. And the bits fell back together in the wrong order. They weren't smashed apart, so they flew apart. This bit of terrain doesn't match that bit of terrain or the terrain up here. And this has given rise to some fantastic scenery, the ice cliffs of Miranda. This is my hot tip. I must tell Elon Musk next time I see him. Uh, that these ice cliffs are about 10 kilometers high. I mean, can, that's over the height of Mount Everest. Can you imagine the view from below? looking up through at these ice cliffs. Miranda's tiny, just a few hundred kilometers across. So the view you would have is the sun in the sky, just a very bright star. Uh, so it's definitely a tourist attraction, like Niagara Falls or <laughs> the Grand Canyon is today. I just say you're worried about our descendants and all the trouble they're going to have deciding where to site the interpretive center. Yeah. Yeah. That's their problem. We're moving on off then to Neptune. It's about the same size as Uranus. These are three t both Uranus and Neptune, three times smaller than Jupiter. It has a moon called Triton, and it has a nitrogen atmosphere as well, like the Earth's, like, like Titan on Saturn. Only it's so cold out here, about 20 times further from the sun than we are, that this blue stuff is the air you're breathing now, frozen as blue ice on the ground. The air freezes to the ground. Uh, very exotic place. We've got a probe heading out to Pluto, which used to be a planet, till an Irish woman chaired a, co a committee a meeting in Austria in 2006, and uh, Dane Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell, good friend of us on the island, so we won't hold it against her. And she gave a lecture about why they decided uh, this for us. 
we now know Pluto is not the same class of object as the other planets are. It's part of a swarm of asteroids out beyond the outer planets. There are probably, we found one that's bigger than Pluto. There's probably a hundred that are bigger than Pluto. And the question was, will we give them all names or are they just a different class of object? If we know we have a moon going around every six days, and here's an artist's impression to sum up the solar system, what it looks like uh, from the edge of the solar system, looking back in toward the sun. We're about 40 times the Earth's distance from the sun, so the sun is a thousand times dimmer than it is on the Earth, freezing cold below, I think it's minus 220 Celsius, not too many degrees above absolute zero. Uh, in a very exotic place, and it's taken a spacecraft nine years to get out there as fast as it could. Uh, we had some first pictures back, and in, Ju in July, actually, we'll get closer pictures of Pluto. More of a curiosity than a, a really a planet that it was when the craft was launched. It would be fun, nonetheless. The only obviously out, out further in our solar system are comets. I love comets in particular. Um, one thing that started me off on this journey was in 1985, when Halley's Comet came back, Leo Enright, who was then the head of RT News, found out there was a group of UC students trying to take the first picture of Halley's Comet from Ireland, which we eventually did about six months before it got closest to the sun. It didn't look like this. It was a tiny blip that got on the nine o'clock news. <laughs> and Leo said, oh, I'm the one that's responsible for all this. <laughs> now, this is a great comet seen in 1997. We actually used this one to launch our magazine in the UK. It did quite well until the BBC launched the Sky at Night magazine. How can we compete with that? Uh, Patrick Moore was a good friend of Astronomy Island. He gave lots of lectures for us. Uh, he um, has, I think, and he said, his producer told me they have, it's one or two million viewers on the Sunday program, one or two million on their Thursday repeat. You know? So they beat the Late Late Show every month with the science program. Uh, but this comp was fantastic. You could see it driving around Dublin. I remember being parked at traffic lights one night, and next to the traffic lights was this comet. You could see it, it was that bright. It was a, a brighter, about as bright as the brightest stars in the sky, with this lovely forked tail, the blue iron gas tail and this yellow dusty tail. Um, this is Halley's Comet itself from 1986, a bit older, so the, the two tails are not as obvious. I went down to Australia to see it, um, because you know it won't be that good when it comes back in 2061. If it wasn't greatly placed from the Northern Hemisphere this time, it would be worse in 2061. So you've been waiting until 2061 to see it, look for some other comet, Halley's Comet's not for you. And that's Comet. We actually, the Irish sent a spacecraft into the heart of Halley's Comet. Uh, well, actually, we cooperate with the European Space Agency. Uh, Professor Susan McKenna Lawler at Maynooth built parts of the spacecraft that measured the particles that were coming off the, the, the comet. And the Germans built the camera. I remember being with Leo in RTE um, on the night that the spacecraft in February was going to go through the heart of Halley's Comet. We get these false color pictures down, none of us understood. We now realize there was contour maps. It wasn't anything like this on the night. And unfortunately, it was a work to rule on in RT8. Close approach was 10 past midnight Irish time, and the staff shut down at, at midnight. So Leo was there voicing over it. it was Newsnight at the time, uh, as the credits rolling up saying, and there is the Giotto spacecraft hurtles through the head of Halley's Comp. We have to leave it. <laughs> and, shut, and the station shut down. We were able to watch the feeds internally, or a bottle of something. And that was great fun. <laughs> So that's my little story about Halley's Comet in Ireland. Uh, by the way, the current comet, 67P, or Trumunov Gerasimienko, uh, he is an Irishman, Lawrence O'Rourke, from Mullingar, who's writing lots of articles for the magazine. Um, well, the reason I'm a bit late tonight is that he rewrote it at 2 a.m. this morning. <laughs> I was supposed to go to the printer at 9 this morning. Uh, all about Philae, they're hoping to restart the little lander. So there's lots of Irish involvement, and they're telling us the kind of stuff they shouldn't really be telling us in our magazine, because it hasn't been published in... in in, in peer-reviewed journals yet, uh, but I'm quite happy to leak some of the stories. If somebody at uh, one of our lectures that one of the uh, scientists gave, he told a whole bunch of stuff that really shouldn't have been uh, uh, released to the public just yet, but we won't complain. And in fact, Lawrence Rourke's going to give a talk to us on in September. He's going to come along to that one. You can't, I'm nearly finished, so you can't uh, get to the stars. It's 6,000 times Pluto's distance from the sun before you get to the nearest star to the sun and it took nine years for spacecraft to get there. So we've got to bring them closer. Here's the telescope I actually visited uh, to see Halley's Comet 1986 at the side of Liberty Hall. And, uh, oh, there's the port of cabin where the astronomers work. So it's curved, a curved piece of glass, there's no optics, so now it just focuses the light up the top. Very similar to the design Isaac Newton came up with in the late 17th century, only on a bigger scale. And here's the kind of pictures it takes. This is the Orion Nebula, a huge gas cloud where we were born, us, the Earth, the sun, the solar system, and lots of other stars as well. Uh, there's a close-up that you can actually see this in a telescope, the four little stars. 
the bright stuff behind, it's a 3D picture, it's the bright stuff behind is behind the screen, those four stars are lighting up, and this tongue of dark material, that's being thrown towards you. So it's actually hollowed out a little, a little section of, of, this, of the nebula, the gas cloud there, and it gives rise to some fantastic pictures. I think these pictures are much better than modern art, and they're real things. This is the Triffid Nebula, the tendrils of material being blown towards us. Eventually left with a cluster of stars, this would be where the sun was born, blowing off the gas and dust. And there's a young cluster. If you just compressed a star like the sun's 10 billion year lifetime down into a human lifetime, these would be a few years old, uh, they'd be toddlers. Eventually they drift apart, become middle-aged, like the sun is now, and then they die like this. This is a kind of nebula you can see in the sky through a telescope, we'll show them to you in August, like the star VQ event, come along. The star in here is the dead core of a star like the sun that blows off for a very short period of its life, maybe only a million years of its 10,000 million years, its outer halo. But this stuff that's blowing off is all the nuclear, re the radioactive, not radioactive, the nuclear waste that it's made. It started off most of the universe is hydrogen, it's the simplest atom, it squashed a few of them together to make helium, it squashed a few of them to make carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Up to about iron, the biggest nucleus you can make, the biggest atom you can make with this process. And then it blows it all off out into space, seeds the clouds, that gets into plants, gets into people. So we're all made of nuclear waste. I know the romantics like to say we're made of star stuff, but we're really made of nuclear waste. <laughs> uh, big stars will blow themselves to smithereens. Now, this is the Crab Nebula, and again an Irish story. It was seen by very few people in the world. It was the Dark Ages. The church was in control. They regarded nothing in, in the heavens changed. And a lot of things weren't recorded at the time, but in 1054, the monks in Clonmac Noise on the River Shannon uh, recorded this star that was visible in broad daylight for several weeks. That's how bright it was. It's 6,000 light years away, so you'd be hard pushed to see any star in the sky that's far away. This thing lit up so bright, you could see it in broad daylight for a few weeks. Here it is, a thousand years later, still rushing apart at several hundred kilometers per second. And in fact, if you look at the blue stuff, doesn't it look like Ireland? Yeah. <laughs> and Lord Ross in, in Burr gave it the name of the Crab Nebula, and he saw all these little tendrils that looked a bit like, I suppose, crab's claws. Um, but in fact, if he had a more blue sensitive camera to take a picture of it, he might call it the Island Nebula instead. Maybe we should rename it. Uh, so that's these are stars that exploded. This one's created a neutron star. Some can create black holes, as you'll hear in our next lecture. As so all these stars go around in giant star cities. The Milky Way has got about a half a trillion stars, so things aren't too accurate on this scale. We'll say a trillion. The average galaxy has got about a trillion stars in it, spinning around every 200 million years. A black hole at the center, controlling the whole galaxy, even though it's only a tiny fraction of 1% of the total mass of the galaxy. We now know most of the galaxy is dark matter, stuff that we don't know what it is. Um, and uh, this that, that was a, an active galaxy. Here's a galaxy we think is very similar to ours. A bit of a bar in the middle of the black hole and spinning spiral arms and all the pink patches are gas clouds where new stars are forming, who knows, maybe life is getting going on them. Um, and there's the view from the edge of the show, which really looks like two fried eggs clapped back to back. <laughs> as Patrick Moore used to say. And then we look out into deep space, the Hubble Deep Field, you can see the universe is peppered with galaxies. There's about a trillion stars in every galaxy in the universe that we can see, and it turns out that there's about a trillion galaxies with a trillion stars. So the trillion trillion stars, let's give it a factor of ten. And we can argue over that after all the universe may be bigger than the observable universe that we can see. And the next telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, is specifically uh, optimized to look at the galaxies that are so far away, they're rushing away, that the bright light from the first ultraviolet stars that were produced has shifted right away past the visible and out into the infrared. And that's what our next lecture is going to be about, or a little bit about that. So that should be interesting when it launches in 2018. We'll be able to use a time machine to look back uh, to the early <laughs> universe. And, uh, then the last slide, I ignored the 15 billion years, it's at 13.8 now, that means you James. But of course you all know that the Big Bang, that there was this tiny part that expanded extremely rapidly uh, because of quantum effects that control the entire microelectronics industry in the world. What's that worth? A few trillion dollars a year? So it's very important science. And of course after about 300,000 years the first atoms formed, and then after a few hundred million years the first stars were able to form, they made the first galaxies. They're controlled by dark matter, which is five times more than the stuff we're made of. And we now know there's something stretching the universe apart. Uh, this dark energy, we have no idea what that is. In fact, our April lecture was a very good one by Professor Andy Shearer about this very subject. Uh, all we know is enough to give it a name. That's all we've got is a name. Uh, hopefully, you know, all these, some of these 80,000 kids don't become astronauts for Elon Musk. If you become physicists, they'll figure out what it's all about. And the last thing that's thought I need to, need to uh, like to leave.
leave you on is that you don't tell the kids this too much. Is that where is it all going? Well, if this dark energy has its way and it keeps accelerating the expansion of the universe, eventually the universe will be expanding so fast, it's going quite slow at the moment. Uh, roughly speaking, the average home, move, the front wall of your house moves away from the back wall of your house at about the width of one atom per year. So your house is probably not going to fall down just yet. But eventually, as time goes on, that will become two atoms a year, three atoms a year, a billion atoms a year. And if you let time go on off enough, it turns out that the space between the, uh, the subatomic particles will be ripped apart and no matter will be able to exist. However, before all that happens, something worse happens. All the stars are going to fall from all the gas clouds that there are. There'll be no more gas clouds left. They'll all fall into the black holes. Hawking says black holes don't last forever. They disappear in the puff of radiation. So eventually, when the black holes gobble everything up and then evaporate, there'll only be a universe where you've got one photon, and then on the edge of its observable universe is the next photon, <laughs> and the next photon after that. So it seems that the universe has no future. If there's some way of having a big crunch, as we used to think before we found dark energy, the whole universe will collapse in on itself, and everything, by definition, vanishes. So the universe doesn't have any future in that regard. And the craziest thing we're adding on that is the fact that on the very long scale, unless we find out what dark energy is, and it's going to stop and do something interesting in the future. The universe has no future. On that happy thought, <laughs> I'm welcome to join us, Ron. Did you all get a copy of the magazine? Yeah. Don't pass it out. You did, great. And make sure you grab one of Tanya, Rachel, and James in the back there. And uh, I don't know if you do questions or whatever, but thank you very much for listening. Do we have any questions for Dave? Just some quick questions. Um, I, I have a question for you. So why do you think there has always been a fascination with astronomy? What is it about astronomy that seems to capture people regardless of their scientific predisposition? Uh, well, one thing we say in, in astronomy on is that we're here to promote interest in astronomy in particular, but science in general. And I actually started out with an interest in chemistry. And I think people are just naturally curious. And you know, there's four million people in Brooklyn, well, six million on the island here, let's say. We've only got 25,000 into Astronomy Island so far. So our job is to convert the other 3.999 something <laughs> million because they're missing out on what the universe is made of. Human beings are naturally curious individuals. And you meet somebody who says, oh, I have no interest in that. You can always get them on the Big Bang or where do they think ca they came from, the almost religious side. Of the universe. So I think it's just because people are naturally curious, that's the way we evolve, it's built into us, we're programmed that way, so we can't help it. And for me, when I got started in astronomy, a friend of mine had a chemistry set, I went home to have a look at that, and he had a telescope in the corner of the room. And I, back then they were very rare, they're now 10 times cheaper in real terms, thanks to the Chinese who make them so cheaply these days. Um, they were very rare back then, but now they're very common. And I want to know what he could see with it. He told me actually Jupiter. And I said, Oh, if I come back this evening, it's got lunchtime. Can we have a look at it? He said, No, it's gone. I said, Where's it gone to? He said, oh, Look at the chemistry set, he said. So we did eventually. And he told me there were books in the school library, which I read. And then I read out all the books in the local public library and the, all the bookshops. And then started writing away from books with no internet back then. And one of the books that struck me, and it's on Astronomy on website, is a sort of scale of, of, of things. And there was a picture of the Earth next to the Sun. I didn't realize how big the Sun was. You just watch a million Earths together to get the Sun. On the next page, the Sun was a little dot, dot like the Earth. And there was a big star, I think it was Aldebaran, next to the Sun. The Sun is huge. That star is huge compared to the Sun. The next page, that star was a small star, and another star next to it. And this went on for five or six pages. And I was flabbergasted that they're not teaching us any of this stuff in school. There's so much out there. All stuff we learned about the Earth is irrelevant. The universe is huge. And my curiosity was piqued. Lee Einstein had his curiosity peaked by magnets. And so something will pique your curiosity, and whether it's Iron Man, Elon yeah. Musk, Hollywood Tony Stark, or, or you know, making a billion dollars by selling off PayPal, whatever gets kids going, that's okay, Michael. Absolutely. Any other questions? No, I think that's it. I think we better wrap it up. And can we have a massive round of applause, please, for <laughs> so, um,